Morning Church. Morning to those of you worshipping online as well. Again, we hope you can join us in person as the fellowship, the people of God. To reflect the urgency of today's message, I'm just going to dive straight in to the passage for today. Taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 40. Then Jesus left the crowd and he went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemies who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Come, let us pray. O Lord, have mercy on us. O Holy Spirit, open up our ears and our hearts. For Lord, if we leave this place unchanged after hearing this word, and we do nothing with our lives, and truly, Lord, not only have I failed as a preacher, but importantly, woe unto us. So Lord, we pray in your mercy, let us hear and be obedient to this word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we conclude our sermon series on knowing God, His nature, character and expression today by focusing on God as judge. God as judge. If we were to take a poll, this topic will probably be the least popular topic among all Christians. Yet, this is a topic that is far too important to ignore and perhaps one of the most important sermons I have preached in years. When we started this Knowing God series, I highlighted Matthew chapter 7. Just a quick recap, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Now remember this phrase, evil doers, we'll come back to it later on. But today's teaching by Jesus reinforces the same point. Not everyone who is in the church today will be included to be with Jesus after the final day of judgment. Look around at the people sitting next to you. Some of them, unfortunately, if we do not listen to this message and repent, we will not see each other on the final day of judgment. Now this Teaching today uh, actually has a broader context. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. This is where Jesus actually first taught the parable. I encourage you to read it on your own. Let me now read the frightful words of Jesus in verse 40. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out of His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom. It's not anywhere else, huh? but people within the kingdom of God Everything that causes sin and all who do evil, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let me be very clear. The scripture is extremely clear as well. There will come a day of judgment for everyone. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And then Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 12, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from His presence. That's how glorious God is. Earth and heaven will flee from His presence and there was no place for them, no place to hide for basically for anyone, no place to hide at all. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And listen here, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So make no mistake, there will be a day of final judgment. And according to the Bible, after this day of giant judgment, there are really only two final destinations for humanity. Number one, it's the lake of fire, as the book of Revelation calls it, or in Jesus' teaching today, the blazing furnace. Other passages will call it, refer to it as Gehenna. We will focus on this phrase later on. That's the terrible destination we want to find ourselves in. And then the blessed destination is the new Jerusalem, 
on the new earth. Again, this concept is taken from the book of Revelation, where God's people will live with Him face to face in the city of God. Now, whether you should take this place as physical or metaphorical, that's not the content, the subject of my sermon today. But it is very clear that one is a great place of joy and blessedness. The other place is a place of great torment, torture, suffering. Jesus here, as well as in many passages in the New Testament, repeatedly warns that evildoers will find themselves in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice how graphic this description is. Weeping. It's not tearing, you know, or just whimpering. We weep at severely devastating conditions, right? That's where we really weep. There's great anguish and sorrow. And then there's the gnashing of teeth, which is basically gritting our teeth together. Usually in two circumstances, either because we are in great pain, you think of movies where they try to extract the bullet out, right? And then you cannot go to the hospital, they have to bite something. Or in great anger, they grit their teeth together. Of course, it could be both. Because those who are judged and found guilty by God, they'll be thrown into the fire. They will, be, they will naturally be angry against God. At the same time, grimacing in pain. Weeping, gnashing of teeth. You just do a short, short Google for yourself and you see how often this phrase repeats in the Gospels. Now, if that scares you, let me give you a short, very short reprieve only by explaining what is the Bible's understanding of life after death. But I have to return to this point later on and declare God's truth to us. In the Old Testament, all of the dead go to one common place. The Hebrew word for this is Sheol, Sheol, the realm of the dead. And when this Hebrew word Sheol was translated into the Greek, they chose the word Hades to represent this word. Now, Sheol is basically a temporary holding place in the Old Testament understanding. This is the place where all the dead go to. Both the righteous as well as the unrighteous, they all go to the same place to await the day of resurrection and judgment. And naturally then, of course, it's unfair. As many of the psalmists write, oh, it's unfair. How can you send the righteous and the unrighteous to the same place? But that is the Old Testament concept. And so by the time of Jesus, and quite understandably so, because of this unfairness in, you know, while both are going to the same place, the concept of life after death broadens significantly, as seen in this parable that Jesus teaches in Luke chapter 16. I read from verse 19 onwards. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all these, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those of us who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, referring to the word of God, right? Moses and prophets refer to the word of God. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, If someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to the Bible, to the mind, to the Moses and prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, the situations described here cannot refer to what happens after the final judgment because the rich man wanted Abraham to send Lazarus back to his family. Presumably, the five brothers are still alive, and that's why he wants to warn them. And so, what is this described here cannot refer to what happens after the final judgment. But clearly, at the same time, we know that there are already two distinct places that people go to after they die. The good one is to be with Abraham, to be at his bosom where Lazarus, the beggar, is found. The bad one, obviously, is in Hades, right? Uh, sorry for uh, that. Oh yeah, where Lazarus is found in Hades. And then the beggar with Abraham in his bosom. 
Another name used to describe the blessed place after death for the beggar is paradise. Sorry, Hades is where the rich man is. Lazarus is with Abraham, right, in his bosom. Now, some English translations, uh, they translate show and Hades as hell. And I think that's an error because this is where much of the misunderstanding occurs. I will reserve the translation for hell in only one particular instance, and it's not to refer to Hades. According to Holman Bible Dictionary, the three Greek words often translated as hell are Hades, Gehenna, Tartarus, or Tataruo in the original Greek. The English is Tartarus. Hades was the name of the Greek god of the underworld and the name of the underworld itself. Right? And so uh, Matthew 16, 18 tells us that Hades is not simply a place of the dead, but represents the power of the underworld. And that's why Jesus said the gates of Hades will not prevail against the advancement of the church. So Hades, as I mentioned to you earlier, is the realm of the dead. The one and only time the Greek word Tartarus appears in the New Testament is in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And this word appears in classical Greek literature, not just in the Bible, but in classical Greek literature, to refer to this subterranean region that is doleful and dark, regarded by the ancient Greeks as the abode of the wicked dead. It was thought of as the place of punishment. And the sole use of the word in the New Testament, it refers to the place of punishment for rebellious angels. Now, Tartarus wasn't designed for humans, but as a place to lock up severely rebellious spiritual beings. Between the Old and New Testament, there are 400 years of silence, but actually not exactly true because in this period, there are also writings and scholars call this the intertestamental literature. So Old and New Testament, 400 years of silence, so-called according to our Bible, but there's actually intertestamental literature. And scholars who study this believe that, some scholars at least, fallen angels from Genesis 6, they are locked up in this place called Tartarus. We come to the last Greek word, which I think rightly can be translated as hell, and that is Gehenna. But Gehenna, you need to understand, in the original uh, understanding, it's really a Greek form of two Hebrew words, ge plus hinum, which is literally the valley of hinum. The term originally referred to a geographical location, an actual place, a ravine on the south side of Jerusalem where pagan deities were worshipped, and get this, where children were sacrificed to idols. You find these accounts also in 2 Chronicles. I've given to you a couple of references, but also in 2 Chronicles 28 and 33. During the reign of Josiah, who is a good, righteous king, he saw that this practice was abominable. How can you sacrifice children to idols? And so he decided to stop this practice. But how did he stop it? He turned the valley of Hinnom into a garbage site, putting all the rubbish there. Naturally, because that place is filled with worms and maggots, nobody wants to go there. And to deal with the garbage, obviously you need to burn it. And that's why the place eventually became associated with a place of burning. It's where garbage is burned. And so Gehenna, therefore, became synonymous as a place of burning and is used as a symbol of punishment. Jesus used the symbolism of Gehenna to describe the place of everlasting punishment, a place that is far away from God. I'll just give you a couple of references. There are many more. Mark chapter 9, verse, 30, uh, Mark verse 9, verse 43. It is better for you to enter into life main than having two hands to go into Gehenna, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Luke chapter 12, verse 5. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast you into Gehenna. And this is where the English translation will put, cast you into hell. Now note this, really the symbolism of Gehenna is really found in its location. It is a place outside of the city of Jerusalem. The ultimate fate of the wicked is suffering outside of the gates of the new Jerusalem. So Gehenna is not Hades. They are technically different from the Greek understanding. Hades is a temporary place of the dead where only the souls exist. Because after we die, our body is left on earth, right? But our souls go to Hades. Whereas in Gehenna, the wicked dead shall exist in both body and soul. At the day of the final judgment, everyone will be re resurrected, both good and evil. One to everlasting joy, the other to everlasting punishment. For your bodies will never die and you feel the pain forever and ever. So the suffering in Gehenna is eternal, while the suffering in Hades is temporal. Gehenna, 
or hell, as my preferred translation, is presently, in my understanding, unoccupied. Why? Because the final judgment hasn't come. So hell is currently not yet occupied. In the future, however, when God judges the wicked angels together with evil humanity, then hell or Gehenna will be inhabited. And surely none of us want to be in that place. So let me summarize. Show the realm of the dead is translated as Hades. Hades is the temporary holding place for the dead. Something that in Hades, there are at least two subdivisions separated by an unbridgeable gulf. On one side are the righteous, the other side are the unrighteous. The righteous are with Abraham, with Jesus in paradise. And technically, if you want to be absolutely accurate, we cannot say believers go to heaven after we die. We don't, actually. Number one, we are destined for the final New Jerusalem, the final destination. And secondly, we just be with Jesus. So if you don't want to go into all the technicalities, you can just say, to be with Jesus, <laughs> right? Believers. Hell, on the other hand, is a word which should be reserved technically, in my understanding, for a place with unquenchable fire after the final judgment. A place like Titarus, originally intended not for humans, but for the devil and fallen angels, Gehenna will be a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so as mentioned earlier, there are really only two final destinations for us as human humanity. Either we are thrown into the lake of fire, Gehenna, which is outside of Jerusalem, or we are with God in the new Jerusalem on the new earth. And so if there are two different places for the dead before the final judgment, one that is good, one is bad in Hades, remember? There are two. One can understand how perhaps the concept of purgatory could have evolved. There are people sympathetic to the concept there is still a chance for those who are dead to respond to Christ, to become a place of purification, to prepare people for the final judgment. But I must add that just being sympathetic doesn't mean you're being correct because the Bible does not teach about purgatory at all. And as Methodists, you need to know that John Wesley took a very hard stance against the teachings of purgatory. In the Articles of Religion, Article 14 in particular, John Wesley explicitly said, that the concept of purgatory is grounded upon no warrant of scriptures, but is repugnant to the word of God. And I fully agree with him. So let's make saving souls our core business on this side of eternity. Don't risk it. Don't wait till oh, maybe God will judge, you know, have mercy on them on, when they are in Hades. That's too risky. Let's preach the gospel passionately while we are still alive, while people are still alive. Let's make it our core business. Also, if we consider ourselves true Methodists, which John Wesley basically insisted is simple, plain old Christianity, we must never take our salvation for granted, which is really the main point for today's sermon. Never take our salvation for granted. Can I say that this idea of once safe, always safe, have you ever heard of this phrase, once safe, always safe, is an extremely dangerous concept? If I'm being uncharitable, actually I would say this is a life on the pits of hell. It's an extremely dangerous concept because this is against the grain of Scripture. Most of what the Bible teaches is not once safe, always safe, but rather to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so indeed, woe to those who preach and believe that once you say the sinner's prayer, that's enough. You're once safe, always safe. You never have to live out the Christian life. Matthew chapter 13, remind us, Jesus teaches very clearly that the angels will weed out of His kingdom. It's not weed out of the world. Huh? It's weed out of His kingdom, so-called people who are called kingdom people, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. In fact, if we return again to Jesus' words in Matthew 7, this is why He says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Remember, I asked you to think, Keep this phrase in your mind, evildoers, all who do evil. In the Greek, is literally lawlessness. Lawlessness. Anomia. Nomos is the Greek word for law. When you let, add the letter A in front, it basically negates or reverses whatever the meaning is. Right? So we even get this still in our English language. You add the letter A in front, you change the entire meaning of the word. And so to be an antinomian means you preach against the law. You are against the law. First John chapter 3, verse 14, uh, verse 4 says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. 
Lawlessness is sin. So my point here is if we make the foolish assumption that just because Jesus has fulfilled the law and we no longer need to live out God's laws just because we profess faith in Christ Jesus, then can I say humbly but lovingly and firmly that actually we are in most danger of being the very lawless evildoers that Jesus warns against. This is such an important point. I want to repeat it and slowly for all of us to hear. If we make the foolish assumption that just because Jesus has fulfilled the law, we no longer have to live under God's laws because we already profess to believe in Jesus, then we are the ones that are most in danger of the fires of hell. The very evildoers that Jesus says are lawless. Now it's true, we cannot save ourselves by our good works. Don't misunderstand me, okay? I'm not saying we can save ourselves by being obedient to the law. The law, as Paul teaches us, you can revise the whole Roman series, shows us that really we need God because we can never fulfill the law. We are, it's true that we are saved by grace through faith alone. That is 100% true. But it is also true that we cannot, save, we cannot be saved if our lives do not live according to God's laws or there is no fruit of repentance or salvation. Our lives are unchanged. There are no fruits of godliness and holiness. So how we live our lives, as will be recorded in the books, how we live our lives will demonstrate if we are truly safe, whether we are truly God's people or not. Let's uh, go back to my previous sermon on God as King. As King, God has certain rules, laws for His kingdom. If you want to be a part of His kingdom, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You need to change your mind. And by implication, extension, you need to change your behavior as well. And so there are certain rules of the kingdom. You need to live according to the rules of the kingdom. And so if you understand Jesus correctly, it's not those who perform miracles who will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the Father, who obey the laws of God. These are the ones who will ultimately be saved from hell. So rejection of God's lawful reign and disobedience to His laws will prevent entry into God's kingdom, even for those who profess faith in Him. Let me say that again. Rejection of God's lawful reign and disobedience to His laws will prevent entry into God's kingdom, even for those who profess faith in Him. So remember, it's not enough to say, I believe in God. Even the demons believe in God. Hello? <laughs> and I didn't say it. It's the book of James. Even the demons believe and they shudder. What about us? We take things for granted. How great then is that judgment that will come to us? Ultimately, it's really subjecting ourselves to live under God's sovereign rule, His order of law, His kingship. Again, here are the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 17 onwards. Do not think, Jesus says, I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Is heaven and earth still around? Yes. Do the laws of God still apply? Yes. As Jesus says, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Pharisees were wrong. In the sense, they only obeyed the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. But here Jesus says, unless your, your righteousness exceeds them, even though they are mistaken in the heart, at the very least, they try to obey the letter of the law. What about us who don't even obey the letter of the law? much less the spirit of the law. How great then is that judgment for us? Now, the very fact that Jesus raised the bar, as you can see in the Sermon on the Mount for yourself, tells us, number one, God is not doing away with the law. He's definitely not doing away with the law. And then number two, it's not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law which God will ultimately judge. Just give you an example, the case of adultery, for example, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. One of the Ten Commandments, right? You know it very well. That is the letter of the law. Do not commit physical adultery. But here Jesus raises the bar, verse 28. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery 
with her in his heart. So he raises the bar. And then he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gorge it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna, throw into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Again, Gehenna. Jesus is saying, look, take sin seriously. Take it seriously. Otherwise, you are in danger of the fires of hell. And so as kingdom people, not only then must we be sexually pure, that is the letter of the law, of course. We must strive towards our purity. But as kingdom people, we must strive towards also purity of heart. And that's why John Wesley taught not only the importance of outward holiness, but also inward holiness. For who else can judge our own thoughts except ourselves and the Spirit of God? Outwardly, yeah, we can see ourselves, and I believe most of us, we don't commit adultery, for example. We all know, right, inwardly, the impurities of our heart. And that's why we need to come to God, ask God for His grace to empower us towards inward holiness. So again, this phrase, once safe, always safe. Very dangerous concept. Because if you just take it as it is, as a cognitive concept, oh, I said the sinner's prayer, I don't have to do anything else, I'm once safe, always safe. Do you see how dangerous it is? It can take us into complacency and lose our salvation at the end of the day. But isn't this assurance of salvation important? As Wesleyans, I say yes, very important. But it is not because of this phrase, once saved, always safe. Our assurance of salvation comes by the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. John Wesley preached this many times. I preached before also. The Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. This assurance will never be taken away from us. But how do I know that you truly have the inner witness of the Spirit? Because you can say, right, I have the witness of the Spirit. How do I know that you are not lying? John Wesley therefore says, it is the fruits of repentance. Your fruits of repentance will show that inwardly you truly are a child of God. You know it. As a child of God, you want to be obedient to the Father and that's why your outward will align with what your inward beliefs are. So is it important to have assurance of salvation? Yes, definitely. But by the gift of the Holy Spirit and by the fruits of our faith. Not believing in this phrase, once saved, always saved. So again, I declare to everyone this hard but important message. Don't think that it is enough to say, I have accepted Christ. Therefore, you are spared from the fires of hell. Don't think about that, that automatically you will have a place in heaven because you accepted Christ. Number one, the idea of accepting Christ actually is foreign to the Bible. Unfortunately, I also need to repent because I've given altar calls with this invitation as well and I realize that's wrong. Accepting Christ is not in the Bible, but following Christ is. And that's the big difference. We need to follow Him wholeheartedly. The, Jesus never asked us to accept Him. <laughs> he asked us and commands us to follow Him. Secondly, as I've shown, heaven is not our final destination. So it's obviously wrong. And third and most important, let's hear the warning that we can be weeded out of God's kingdom on the final day of judgment if our lives do not show conformity to God's laws, that we have not shown that we are living really as kingdom people. In other words, to simplify it, you cannot confess Christ and continue to live as a sinner. It's impossible. You cannot confess Christ and continue to live as a sinner, giving the lame, lazy excuse, oh, I'm covered by grace. Why do I say lazy? Later on, you will see it in some of the parables that Jesus teaches as well. But here, I want to quote this Korean-American pastor, Peter Sukahira, who is now residing in Israel. I want to quote him at length as he reflects on the importance of understanding God's law in light of God's grace. So if there's God's grace, then how do we understand God's law? Does it mean that grace has removed the law? No, let's understand it from his perspective. Grace, God's grace is free but not cheap. Cheap grace is a message that lowers the standards of God's laws or casts scorn on the value of divine law as the way God governs His eternal kingdom. I heard preachers on television say that the Old Testament is concerned with the law, but the New Testament is about grace. 
And we have to choose between the two. Enforcing us between this false choice, they say that the law means legalism, judgment, condemnation, but grace is all about love and mercy. Their message is that Jesus paid the entire price for all our sins once and for all. Therefore, we are forever free from the requirements of God's law by the free gift of grace. Now, what's wrong with that? Didn't, didn't Jesus die to give us His salvation as a free gift? Doesn't the New Testament teach that we are justified, made righteous before God by faith in Him? Yes, this is true. But if I had stopped listening there, I might have come to the wrong conclusion about God's reason for saving me by grace. It was God's moral requirements in His laws that defined sin and convicted me as a sinner. Before I knew God's laws, I didn't have a need for grace at all. If God has high standards, then I need great grace to be declared by Him as righteous. But if God has low standards, His grace doesn't need to be that amazing or precious. And so any message that overtly or subtly by suggestion reduces the requirements of God's laws cheapens grace. One fact about human nature is that we all love finding bargains. Like the crowds swarming to a half price sale in a shopping mall, a pastor or teacher who cheapens grace will find that at least initially a lot of people will be interested to attend his church. However, they may not go on to become disciples of Christ. Isn't it true? We see it in our days too. And then he goes on to say, I understand that the Bible teaches mercy triumphs over judgment. Yes, that is true. But I also knew that mercy can never replace judgment. Mercy only has real value to me when I know I deserve judgment. I received mercy as a free gift of God's grace and began to appreciate all the more because the Bible teaches that God always has and always will rule His kingdom by law. Mercy has to be the exception to the law. What if there was a judge in a city who always decided in every case to show mercy? Soon, every serial killer, rapist, child molester, professional gangster, they would just line up outside that, court, that judge's courtroom, right? Why? Because no one will be punished. No one will be compelled to change and everyone will go scot-free. Is that God's kind of mercy or is that simply injustice? Is that mercy or simply injustice? He continues, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian pastor in Germany during the 1930s when Nazism was rising to power. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he says that God's mercy is not meant to be applied to everyone as a doctrine, but as a gift given personally and individually by God Himself to those who put their trust in His Son, Jesus. When God gives mercy, He does not nullify or change His laws. Thus, the one who receives mercy must afterwards seek to remain hidden in Christ. It is not a once-off decision. In short, you must always remain hidden in Christ, which means to live in a way that meets the demands of God's righteousness. Bonhoeffer pointed out that justification by faith means that God justifies the sinner, but not the sin. And so when I fell into sin and turned to God through faith in Jesus, I received grace to be forgiven and I was justified, which means restored to righteousness. And get this, God said, you are okay now, but go and sin no more. He wasn't saying, don't worry, your sins are okay now. Don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> Big difference here. Go and sin no more. It's not the same as don't worry about it anymore. And then you continue sinning over and over again. If we truly understand grace, grace does not excuse us. It does not exempt us. Rather, it must empower us. If we are truly filled by God's grace, we will be empowered by the Spirit of God to live in obedience to God's laws just as Jesus was. 2 Corinthians chapter 3.17 has often been taken out of context. It says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And taken out of context, it seems to imply you can continue to do whatever you want, continue to sin, do anything you like, your life does not change. Well, because the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That is totally misreading this passage. In fact, you know, this taken out of context becomes a license for you to break every rule. And it becomes lawlessness, antinomianism. And that's the problem. You need to understand that the Spirit of the Lord is the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, it's the same Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will never lead us to do something 
that Christ wouldn't do. Would Christ sin? No. How can it be that now you are under the power of the Holy Spirit, you sin? Cannot be. Christ lived in full obedience to the Father because of the Holy Spirit upon Him. And so if we are truly led by the Spirit of God, there is liberty in the sense we are not bound by the worldly systems. We no longer have the burdens or being or peer pressure, whatever the temptations of the world, that is the freedom that we have. Freedom from sin. But there is always obedience to the Father. And so how can it be that if we, for example, are filled by the Spirit, we are never called to sacrifice anything. The Spirit of the living Lord was upon Jesus and He gave His life. Isn't it strange and ironic how we can be filled by the Spirit and never make any sacrifices for the kingdom? Surely something is amiss. In fact, one possible sign that you may be the one that this message is about, that you may be weeded out of the kingdom of God on the day of final judgment is if you have never suffered any forms of persecution before in your entire life as a Christian. Let me say that again. If you have never suffered any form of persecution ever in your whole life because you are a Christian, maybe that is a warning sign. Why? Because the world will always hate Christians because we convict them of sin. The Holy Spirit will use us to convict them, hey, there is right and wrong. And as the world was, you know, as the world persecuted Jesus, Jesus says, all who follow him will receive persecution. Maybe if you're not persecuted, it's because you are so well hidden, but not in Christ, huh? <laughs> so well hidden that people don't even know you are a Christian. You go partying like everybody else. Eh? What's the difference? You don't do your work lazy like everybody else. You are very hidden indeed. <laughs> and that's why you're not persecuted. And maybe that is the greatest warning sign to you. Hey, wake up. So let me put it across again differently. If we are merely accepting Christ or adding Christ to our lives and our lives are not transformed in any way, be careful. You may be in the danger of the fires of hell after judgment day. Now, this message I'm preaching is not directed towards non-Christians. Some of us came into the faith because people shared about the dangers of hell with us, right? Then we, wow, oh, better come into, better believe. I don't think that's the way of evangelism. Personally, I believe that God's kindness leads us to repentance. And God demonstrated His power through healing. So it is God's love and power that brings people into the kingdom. And so this message is not directed towards non-Christians and scare them into heaven because of scare or the fires of hell. But this message is directed towards us as believers. Read again the Gospels very carefully. The warnings of Scripture are not directed towards non-Christians, but towards Christians. Who is the bridesmaid who wasn't prepared for the bridegroom's arrival? Who had no oil in the lamp? Who didn't prepare for the day of the Lord's coming? It's the lazy Christian who took things for granted, sleeping, don't care, I'm already covered by grace, I have a relationship with the bridegroom. I know him, he knows me. At the end, they are knocked out, locked out. They are not allowed to come into the kingdom, into the celebration, the feast. Who is the wicked servant who buried his talent in the ground? Because they had a wrong understanding of who the master is. That was his excuse, right? Oh, I know you are a terrible slave master, therefore I just buried your ground. And so the master shrewdly says, if I'm truly a terrible master, shouldn't you have done at least a little bit by putting the talent in the ground so they can earn interest? But because you have the wrong concept and actually you're wicked and lazy, out you go, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, another parable, there's so many, i just give you three. Who is the wedding guest who's there to show up without wedding garments, without the proper clothes? If you read this parable, Matthew 22, God invited many people to the feast. Some rejected. They spurned God. So God said, okay, go out to the streets. Grab everyone. Grace is free now for everyone. So everyone comes, right? But look at the person who is not properly dressed. Why is the person not properly dressed? There is no preparation. No heart. And God says, throw this person out. Where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The message is directed towards Christians, not non-Christians. So friends, I love you. Huh? That's why I'm preaching this message. If I don't love you, I will not preach this message. Do all you can, not just to enter into the straight and narrow path, but to stay hidden in Christ. Stay on this straight 
and narrow path because God will hold us accountable for how we live our lives. Don't think you can just escape eternal torment. Oh, I've accepted Christ. No, please. Scripture wants us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Time is catching up. There's so much more to be uh, said about this topic, but I have to conclude. I hope to conclude in a way that is memorable, practical, applicable. So one day we will all stand before God's judgment throne, believers, unbelievers alike. We will both be resurrected, some to eternal joy, some to eternal punishment. And so make no mistake, on that day, God will not judge us you know, by our KPI, our Key Performance Index, whether we have said the sinner's prayer, whether we have attended church or attended Bible study classes. Although, don't misunderstand me, these are very important means of grace to keep us on a straight and narrow path. He will not save us, but He helps us to stay on the straight and narrow path. These are key elements of discipleship, but these elements do not save in themselves. Rather, God will judge us by KOI. Not KPI, but KOI. Key Obedience Index. Don't think of koi, eh? bubble tea. <laughs> but it's to help you remember. KOI, Key Obedience Index. Are we in conformity? Do we look like Jesus? When we see him face to face, will he say, Hey, I don't know you. <laughs> you don't look like me at all. Get away from me, you evildoer. Or will he say, Hey, you look like me. Come and share your master's joy and happiness. So how do you think we will fare on that judgment day? Who will we be resembling and looking like? Next week, we will begin our mission with the master's six weeks campaign in line with the season of Lent, a time of repentance, reflection. If we understand the scriptures correctly, going on mission with the master is not an option. You cannot say, Ayah, this one I reserve only for pastor and the PTM, the rest of us, we accept Christ enough already. If you truly understand mission with the master is not an option. We are either riding with the king towards victory or we are being lazy and left behind. Because our king is always on a mission, on a quest to save souls. We are either in obedience to our God and master or we are not. We are either lazy and taken our salvation for granted or we are diligent, dutiful, serving our master. There is really no middle ground. I conclude with the book of Revelation in all seven letters to the church in the book of Revelation, Jesus ends with the same exhortation. To the one who conquers. You can read it for yourself. Jesus says, I will give a certain reward. To a different church, he will give a different reward. But it's the same phrase for all the seven churches. To the one who conquers. Not to the one who sit around, wait for heaven. Please, huh? read your Bibles carefully. It is the one who conquers who is willing to give their life. These are the ones that Jesus says, I will give the reward. So accepting Christ, I'm pretty sure, won't cut it on the day of final judgment. It's not going to cut it. When Jesus returns, but this time he will come back as judge and conquering king, only those who endure to the end, those who work out their salvation with fear and trembling, they know how much they have been saved, this grace, they treasure it and hold on tightly and don't want to waste it. Only those who live lives of holiness, obedience, conformity to God's laws. Those who long for His reappearance. Those who conquer and overcome in Jesus' name, even though they're persecuted, they refuse to deny Jesus. These are the ones who will reign with Christ in the new Jerusalem. There is no middle ground. We are either with Him or not. Whoever has ears to hear, let him or her hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Come, let us pray. Lord, it's a difficult message. But Lord, I thank you that you love us so much, you've given us the opportunity to hear this message so that there is still time for us to repent and make things right. Lord, forgive us if we have taken grace, salvation for granted. We repent. Lord, for indulging, continually indulging in sin, despite being called your people, we repent. Indeed, there are so many areas where we need to repent of. And so people of God, I'm just giving you a moment as the music team plays, you make your own
prayer of repentance and recommitment to the Lord. In a short while, I will pray for us again. Let us pray. Lord, you are judge. For some, this will bring comforting news because all the injustices we have suffered, one day you will right all the wrongs. And so we take comfort that you will right the wrongs. But for others, it's a frightful message because our sins, our secret sins, our laziness will be completely exposed. And for us who find ourselves in this category, we ask for your mercy and grace. As we repent, we make a decision to change our lives, to live in accordance to your laws by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I pray you will move, send your Holy Spirit and empower all of us to live holy, righteous lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.